let's focus our attention on number two tonight. And then again, as I said earlier, number three is in the morning. Remember, we're looking at three different categories of objections. Whenever your friend objects to the Bible, I'm, I'm confident that that objection can fall in one of the three categories this weekend. The first of those categories, as we've already seen in the first session, is this issue of origins. And we just plucked the one example of origins out with the Gospel of Thomas as an example. And now we get to the issue of transmission. Now, this is really a second category of objections entirely because this is asking a question that most people don't pause to ask. Most people want to ask the question, is the Bible true? Great question. But this particular objection undercuts all that and says it doesn't really matter if the words of the Bible are true if you don't have the words of the Bible. In other words, why are we worried always talking about whether the Bible is true? How do we even know we have the Bible, says the second objection. After all, when you hold the Bible in your hand, you're not holding the Bible. When you hold the Gospel of Luke in your hand, you're not holding the Gospel of Luke. As this objection goes, instead what you're holding is a copy of 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 Luke at best. And each of those copies along the way were changed, and they were corrupted, and they were modified by scribes. So yes, you hold something that you call Luke, but you don't know if it really is Luke. It could be very different than the Luke that Luke wrote. It doesn't look anything like the Luke that you have. And so you say that Luke's inspired. Good for you, says the critic. But you don't have Luke, so it's just a non-issue. That same speech can be given to any book of the Bible, right? Whether it's Luke or Romans or Galatians or the book of Revelation. It's this idea of the transmission, okay, of the New Testament text and whether we have the text as it happens to have been written in our current day, or whether we have some corrupted, tainted, twisted, sort of off version of it that doesn't really tell us anything about the original Bible. Now, this whole uh, narrative I just laid out for you has become sort of popular trope in critics of the Gospels these days, and it was popularized by a book uh, a number of years ago by Bart Ehrman called Misquoting Jesus. Uh, Most of you probably have heard the name Bart Ehrman. Uh, He's a professor uh, at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and wrote a book in, I think, 2006, if I'm remembering correctly, somewhere around there, 2005, 2006, called Misquoting Jesus that basically argued what I just laid out, which is you cannot trust the New Testament documents because you don't actually have them. You have copies, corrupted copies of them spread over thousands of years. Um, That book actually ended up becoming a New York Times bestseller, which is stunning when you think about it. A book on textual criticism becoming a New York Times bestseller? I'm thinking, how in the world did that happen? Um... And uh, it happened, uh, I think, for many reasons, but one of the things that, of course, sells books is when you try to sort of come up with ideas that all that you thought you knew is not true, those kinds of books, um, those are real popular. If you write a book that says everything that you already believe is true, no one wants to buy those books. Um, I figured that out, trust me. Um, So uh, I need to write some of these other books. Maybe I'll do a little better. Um, but uh, regardless, uh, Ehrman wrote this book. It did become a New York Times bestseller. And since that day, this has been a topic of conversation at the, at the popular level. Of course, it was a topic of conversation for generations on the scholarly level. But now at the popular level, people are talking about textual criticism and textual variance and manuscripts and mistakes and, and transmission and corruption and these sorts of things that most people never bother to think about. And so this is where we tackle the second category of objections. Do we have any reason to think that we possess the words that were originally written. Because you remember, when we say we believe in inspiration, we believe that inspiration applies to the words that were originally written. Do we actually have any reason to think we have those words? Uh, I think we do. Um, So here's how we're going to lay this out uh, tonight. Very simply, I'm going to lay out Ehrman's challenge in more detail, um, and we're going to learn exactly what he's arguing. And then I'm going to lay out a response. And my response is going to sort of be trifold response. We're going to look at three different things we know about ancient manuscripts uh, of the New Testament and what we can deduce from those manuscripts to help us have confidence uh, that they've been transmitted reliably. So let's start with Roman number one there, and that is the challenge uh, in Misquoting Jesus. Now, Misquoting Jesus is a book that, of course, says more than these two things I lay out for you here. And if you want to know more about Ehrman's Misquoting Jesus and more about this issue, I also want to refer you to my website. Um, It wasn't mentioned uh, in the introduction, but um, I'll mention it here because I hope it's a good resource for you. So my website's name is called Canon Fodder, Um, and by the way, that's Canon with one N, or you'll miss the pun if you don't know that. 
And of course, once you have to explain a joke, it's no longer funny, so um, it's already left it there. Uh, but Canon Fodder is the name of the website, and I deal with issues related to Canon, um, but also text and textual criticism. And I have a section on there on book reviews, and I have a review of Ehrman's Misquoting Jesus up there if you want to go more in the detail on that. But here's the two major claims. And by the way, I have topics, other stuff on, on the website that covers a lot of the material this weekend. We'll talk, I talk about canon, text, transmission, content, theology, diversity, et cetera. And you can go on there and look under the article index and, and uh, look for what topic is of interest to you. So I hope that's a helpful resource. The reason I, I started that website is because I, I realized that some people just never read a book that I wrote. Um, I hope that's not you, but if that is you, um, you can go read the website. I try to digest a lot of that material uh, in, in bite-sized form. Okay, so Ehrman's book has two main challenges in it, amongst many others. Let me just lay out what they are. First is a comment about Christian scribes, okay? Ehrman makes the argument that script, Christians, we can't trust the New Testament manuscripts because Christianity had no infrastructure uh, by which to copy manuscripts reliably. If you're going to have a reliable manuscript uh, process, you have to have reliable scribes to copy manuscripts. In other words, you have to have a scribal infrastructure, scribal culture, uh, scribal community that knows what it's doing, that's professional, and can get the job done well. And Ehrman says that's not what you have in early Christianity. In fact, what you have in early Christianity is, is a bunch of amateurs, he claims, um, that Christian scribes didn't know what they were doing. They made a lot of mistakes. They were rookies. In fact, he even makes the argument at one point that there were Christian scribes who couldn't even read and were still trying to copy uh, ancient manuscripts. Um, and so he makes the case that the scribal infrastructure of early Christianity just wasn't up to the challenge. Now, I'm going to respond to that in due time, but let me mention the second claim he makes, and that is about the number of textual variants. Ehrman makes a stunning numerical claim in his book, and he repeats this throughout lectures he gives all over the country, uh, but he says it in his books, and he claims there's more variations in the New Testament manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. Uh, what is a textual variation? A textual variation is when you lay out two manuscripts side by side, and you realize that one is different from the other. Uh, so let's imagine we have two copies of Galatians, and we lay them out one side by side, and we realize that a scribe in one place wrote one word, but then in the other manuscript, a different word appears there. That's a difference or a variation. Those are called textual variations, and they have to do with handwritten manuscripts. Every time I use the word manuscript in this lecture, I'm talking about a handwritten Greek copy of the New Testament that precedes Gutenberg, right? When Gutenberg comes, there's no longer need for handwritten copies in the same way, and so we usually stop our counting process at that particular time. Well, Ehrman makes a stunning claim, and that is there's between 200,000 and 400,000 textual variations in our manuscript tradition, more than there are words in the New Testament. Now, that's a scary stat. Um, you'll hear that stat and go, well, I guess we could just, just close up shop. Now, if that stat's true, then you could never know what the New Testament says, uh, and maybe we're all wasting our time. But stats are tricky things. Uh, Mark Twain once quipped about stats uh, when he included them under the three kinds of lies he says people tell. He says there's three kinds of lies. There's lies, there's really bad lies, and he didn't use the phrase really bad, uh, and then he said, and then thirdly, there's statistics. Um, and his point with that is that statistics can be as misleading as a lie. I'm not suggesting that Ehrman is lying, be clear, I'm not. I am suggesting that stats can be misleading. 200,000 to 400,000 textual variants? I think Ehrman's right about that number. Just to scare you for a moment. Uh, you're thinking, I thought you were supposed to say you disagree with them. I don't disagree about that number. I disagree about the meaning of that number, which we'll come back to uh, in a moment. That's the challenge. And, and, the, and the sort of nuts and bolts of this challenge is, therefore, what you believe about the New Testament just doesn't have any foundation. It's, it's just floating in thin air. When you say you believe in this particular teaching of Jesus, what if he didn't say it? If you believe in this particular truth from Paul, what if it wasn't really there? And what you've been banking on all these years just is a myth. Now, of course, if he's right, then he's, then, and, and we can't know what those words were, then, then we do have a serious problem within Christianity. But I want to argue here that actually we have very good reasons to know what these words are. So let's look at Roman numeral two, and here's where I'm just going to make my response uh, to Ehrman's case by laying out three different facets of what we know about New Testament manuscripts just to help you see why we think we can know what these manuscripts um, really do um, say. And I think this is the kind of case I hope once again that you can kind of repeat back, if you will, um, uh, to folks at least as much as you can remember it 
in conversations where this might come up. So let's talk about these three things one at a time. We begin with the quantity of manuscripts. One of the things that's noteworthy about the reliability of the New Testament is we stand in a very good position as it pertains to the number of manuscripts we have. Now, people may wonder, well, why does it matter how many manuscripts you have of any document of antiquity? Well, it matters a lot, actually. In the copying process, the more manuscripts you have of a particular document, the more you can compare them to one another. And this allows you to do something very important, and that is that you can see if and where the text is changed. Moreover, it doesn't just allow you to see when and where the text has changed. It also gives you a great reassurance if you have a lot of manuscripts that the original text is probably in there somewhere. Okay? Uh, think, for, think about it for a moment. What if we had a copy of, say, the Gospel of Mark, and we only had one? Doesn't we just had, in the entire ancient world, all we had was one copy of the Gospel of Mark? Now, by the way, you might think, well, that's kind of scary. Actually, we have a lot of documents from history you only have one copy of, just as a side note. Um, but let's imagine that was true for Mark for a moment. You might think, well, what did all the other copies look like? And how do I know that this is a good one? And if this particular copy has a textual variant and made a mistake, can I recover the thing that was, that was left out in another manuscript? Well, no, because I don't have the other manuscript. So if you only have one copy of something, you're left in a difficult position. So what does this mean? In the world of ancient manuscripts, the more the better. You want to have as many manuscripts as you can of any document in the ancient world. And by the way, manuscripts are hard to come by. Uh, they're lost for all kinds of reasons. They wear out, just like modern books wear out. Uh, they're thrown away, they're burned, they're eaten by insects, they rot, they're lost, they're destroyed in war. I mean, when it comes to manuscripts, they just don't have as many as we wish we could get. And that's true not just for the New Testament, but for any other document of antiquity. In fact, from the time period we're talking about, roughly 2,000 years ago, uh, the quantity of manuscripts on average is about 10 to 20 from, from documents from that time period. So if you take anything from that time period, just randomly, the average number of manuscripts we're going to have from that time period is probably about 10 to 20. I'll give you a few examples there in your notes. Tacitus, Annals of History, we have about three copies of that. Jewish War by Josephus is actually pretty good, 50 copies. And we could talk about other documents from antiquity at this particular point, but what's stunning is the number of copies that we have of the New Testament. The number is always changing, by the way. Right now we have over 5,700 uh, manuscripts of the New Testament. Now, I know when you hear that number, it just doesn't do anything for you. You're like, okay, so that's a big number, and it just kind of bounces off your head. But what I can tell you, that number is stunning. That, no that number is, is, is unbelievably uh, stunning in terms of its uh, distinctiveness in antiquity. There's no other document in the entire history of the ancient world that even comes close to having that number of copies. Um, in fact, it's kind of almost embarrassing to have that many copies. Uh, in a positive way. Um, like, well, we feel kind of bad about it. For all you other historical documents out there, we're, we're sorry, right? The New Testament is in such a better position than any others. And remember, the more you have, the more you can compare them, the more you can see if they change. And if something has been left out or changed or messed up, you have all these other copies that can fix the problem that could have gotten the text right. And so the more, the better. And the New Testament stands out in a place utterly by itself. Now, once you realize the number of copies, a couple things become apparent here, which are really, really important, is that this actually explains why we have so many textual variants. Um, remember when I mentioned the 200,000 to 400,000 textual variants that Ehrman talked about? And I told you that I think that number actually might be right. We don't actually know the number for that matter, but I think it's probably in the ballpark. And you might think, oh no, what does that mean? Well, let me explain something to you. The only reason we know about that many textual variants is because we have so many more manuscripts than any other document in antiquity. Think about it for a moment. How many textual variants do you think we have in Tacitus' uh, Roman history? Well, you think we only have three copies of it. So how many textual variants could you even have? Well, with three copies, you could only possibly observe so many scribal variations. But what if you had 5,000 copies of Tacitus' Roman history? Would you have a lot more textual variations to talk about? Yes, because every new manuscript you find gives you another opportunity to do what? Discover new textual variations that another scribe, for his own reasons, added to the text. What you realize then is that the only reason we have so many textual variants 
is only because we have so many copies of the New Testament that go far and above every other document in the ancient world. So it's almost like you can't win in the Christian world. If you didn't have many copies, they'd say, oh, Christians don't have that many copies. And if you do have a lot of copies, they'd say, well, you have so many textual variants, but only because you have so many copies. It's almost a catch-22. It's kind of being a victim of your own success here. We did so well in preserving so many copies that now we've got so many people piling on about all the scribal variations they can now notice because of all those copies. And I want to suggest to you that that's profoundly misleading when it comes to statistics. Make no mistake about it. If we only had a normal number of copies of the New Testament, we wouldn't even be having this conversation tonight. It wouldn't even be a topic because the, the New Testament is not copied in any more unreliable way than any other document in the ancient world. Just as a side note here, by the way, we're still finding New Testament manuscripts. Um, we fi actually, we find them uh, probably every year uh, in, in various archaeological digs around the world. Uh, there's a very well-known archaeological dig at a place called Oxyrhynchus, Egypt. Um, you're thinking, Oxyrhynchus, there's a word I'm going to forget in the next 30 seconds. Um, although if you can remember it, you could say it at a party and impress people, right? <laughs> have you heard about the archaeological dig at Oxyrhynchus? They're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Oxyrhynchus, Egypt, there was an archaeological dig begun there at the end of the 1800s, just to put this in perspective, by uh, two British scholars by the name of Grenfell and Hunt, probably 1895-ish. They found the lost city of Oxyrhynchus, which was lost, and when they found the lost city of Oxyrhynchus, the place they found was actually the, the, the manuscript garbage dump for the lost city of Oxyrhynchus, where everyone threw out all their old manuscripts. Think of, it, think of an analogy of as, as a place where everyone threw out their old, all their old newspapers and all their old letters and all their old books. Imagine a, a garbage dump like that in our modern day. Imagine finding that in the ancient world. That's what they found in Oxyrhynchus. And since the eight, late 1800s, they have had an active dig in Oxyrhynchus to this day, where they're finding just thousands and thousands of manuscripts of all kinds of writings, Homer, Plato, personal letters, what's called documentary papyri, and so on. Um, and, of course, they also find biblical texts, Old and New Testament, and, of course, lots of New Testament manuscripts. In fact, a good number of our New Testament manuscripts actually come from Oxyrhynchus. And every so often, usually every year or a couple years, they'll come out with a new volume of the Oxyrhynchus papyri, which I'm sure you're rushing out of the bookstore to buy as soon as it comes out. But if you did, you would find new copies of Romans, Galatians, John, Matthew, and so on in there. And people ask me all the time, hold on a second. If we're finding new manuscripts every year, why don't we ever hear about it? Why does it make it on the ABC News or something like that? Why isn't it all over the web? Here's the answer. It's because when they find a new manuscript of, say, John or Mark or what have you, it looks just the same as every other manuscript they found. I asked my students, do you think if they found a copy of, say, Luke that was radically different than the Luke you're reading, do you think that would make it to the evening news? The answer is absolutely. You can be assured that as we continue to find manuscripts, what you'll find is, is the consistency becomes very apparent the further we go down the line. All right, let's look at a second thing about our manuscripts, not just the quantity, uh, but the date. Here's the dream of, of text critics. The dream of text critics is you don't just want a lot of manuscripts, you also want manuscripts that are early, right, to the original publication of the document. In other words, if you have a copy of something, you want it to be copied as close to the original publication as that document as you can possibly get. So let's say that Matthew was written in 60 AD, we want a manuscript as close to 60 AD as we can. Why? Because the less gap of time you have in a manuscript, the better. Think about it for a moment. What if our earliest copy of Matthew was 800 AD? We couldn't get any further back in time than 800 AD in terms of a copy of Matthew. We know Matthew was written in the first century, but our earliest copy is 800 AD. You're thinking, man, that's not good. All right, 700 years in there of copying going on, 700 years of change, and all I've got is something in 800 AD to tell me you know, what Matthew's like. How do I know Matthew hasn't changed in all that amount of time? You might think, that's not good. In fact, you might think that's so bad we couldn't know anything about a book. Here's the thing to realize is that gap of time, 800 years, is about average for documents from the first century. In fact, I've included that in your notes, a few examples. Tacitus is Roman history. It's about, well, it's about 800 year gap. Written, in the written around 100, or earliest copies from the 9th century. Um, it's about exactly an 800-year gap. The Jewish war is about a 900-year gap. And might you, think, you might think, how many people are upset or worried about the content of Jewish war or Tacitus' Roman history, but yet we have almost a 1,000-year gap uh, in between these two uh, manuscripts and their earliest copy. Now, you think about that. What we would really like is to get as close as possible. Now, 
in the ancient world, the further back you go, what do you, what do you, what do you face with? The further back in time you go, you just have less manuscripts, right? Because they have more time to wear out. So if you went back, you know, 500 years, you'd find a certain amount. 800 years, you'd find a certain amount. The further back you go, the less you have. But what's stunning about the New Testament is, once again, that gap closes. We have a good number of manuscripts of the New Testament, even from the second century. Uh, I'll give you a few examples here in your notes. One of our earliest manuscripts, of course, was this little manuscript uh, by the name of P52, um, which is a copy of the Gospel of John from about 125 A.D., found in Egypt. Now, you have to realize that Gospel of John was probably written around 80 or 90 A.D. in Ephesus, and we found a copy from 125 in Egypt. That's an amazing fact. One is it's only about a 35-plus year gap, uh, and then also it's clear across the empire. That's a stunning reality. Now, in, your, in our little world, 35 years is just, it might seem like a long time in our lives, right? Um, some of you weren't even alive 35 years ago, right? Some of you wish that you could remember past 35 years ago. But in the world of antiquity, a 35-year gap between a manuscript copy and what was written from 2,000 years ago is stunningly small. There's nothing that even comes close. And it's not just P52. I have a class I do at seminary where we look at a manuscript called P66, which is almost a complete copy of John from the second century. It's almost complete. And, and what's amazing about P66 is that the front page of John with the titles intact, which is really rare in the ancient world because when books wear out, what's the pages that always wear out first on books? The, 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 the front and back, right? The cover. Uh, first pages and the last pages are always the ones that wear out first, even in the books you have. Same, true, same is true in the ancient world, but in this copy of John, we actually have the prologue 100% intact. And in my Greek class, my students read it because we have a spot where we read it from P66 in class, and they're like, this is exactly the same as our prologue now. And they're always amazed, even though they knew it and believed it, that here's a manuscript that's nearly a complete copy of John from the second century. I can tell you that gap of time is so small, that it's, it's utterly irrelevant. It's negligible. You can't have the kind of massive changes that Ehrman needs in that small a gap of time. And it's not just John. We have many copies of John, Matthew. One of the books we have a lot of copies of from the second century is Revelation. We have a number of these types of books uh, from the second century. Uh, and so the date of the manuscripts becomes very important to us when we think about um, why we can trust these things. Let's look now at the third uh, thing we find uh, about our manuscripts, and that is something about the quality of them. So we have a lot of them. And we have a lot of them that are dated to an early time, so that gap between when they were originally written and our earliest copy is small. But there's another question lingering out there, and that is, well, are they any good, though? Right? I mean, maybe I have a lot of really bad copies. Maybe I have a lot of very early but very lousy copies. Right? In other words, I could have 5,700 just terrible copies, even if a bunch of those are from the early centuries, they could be bad too. In other words, what's the quality of these manuscripts like? So let's say a word about that. There's so much to say on this point, but I'm just going to try to highlight a few things. The first thing I want to say about the quality is something about the textual variance. What kind of changes do we find uh, in our manuscripts? What's encouraging about our manuscripts when we look at them is that we can see evidence in them that they've been very carefully copied. Um, I can... I'll get into more of this in a moment, but for now, what, there's a number of things we see in our manuscripts that tell us this. One is the way they were, they were corrected. Um, they, they have a whole system in the ancient scribal world of not just copying a text, but going back over that text carefully, meticulously, seeing any mistakes they had, and then correcting those mistakes carefully. Moreover, we see a number of manuscripts where the corrections come in a second scribal hand, suggesting that the copying is done in groups. We have one scribe do the main copy, and then you have another set of eyes on that text checking the work, so to speak. What you, what you see then is probably evidence for early scriptoriums within Christianity where these kinds of copying is taking place. The other thing I'll say here about the, the, the kind of changes in our manuscripts is we have to ask the question of, of not just how many there are, but what kind of changes they are. Ehrman's 200,000 to 400,000 number is a stunning number but it's vastly mitigated already by what we said. You only know about that many because of the manuscripts. But it's also vastly mitigated by another fact, and that is that the vast majority of those 200,000 variants are utterly irrelevant for knowing the original meaning of the New Testament. In other words, they're the kind of changes that don't have any effect on the text at all. 
I cover this in my book, The Heresy of Orthodoxy, in the last chapter for those of you who want to read more about it, but I'll just mention one thing here, and that is the vast majority of these textual variations are spelling errors. There are mistakes in the way they spell words. In case that makes you feel any better, people in the ancient world couldn't spell much better than we can in the modern world, right? Here's what's amazing, is that the scribes, for all their work, actually did a pretty good job of spelling, given the lack of technology they have, right? When I see a spelling error in a paper in my classes today, I'm fairly intolerant about it. Why? Because you had every chance to get this right. You had, like, a computer yelling at you and putting red underlines under this, and I mean, you have every reason not to miss spelling mistakes here, but in the ancient world, you could almost give these guys a break. And yeah, they did a pretty good job as a whole, but they still made spelling mistakes from time to time. Um, and this shouldn't surprise us. But as you know, spelling mistakes aren't going to change the meaning of a text. You don't read a text and find a spelling error and go, well, I guess I'm chucking this in the trash. It has no good at all. When's the last time you, or, you, you read a newspaper and, and found an error? I bet you have, and I bet you had recently. If you're sitting down in the morning, does anyone even read newspapers anymore? I don't know. But if you're reading the newspaper in the morning, you notice a typo, do you think, well, this whole thing's shot. I'm just throwing this in. This is completely unreliable. No, you think, well, they made a mistake. And you know what you do? You intuitively correct it on the fly. You can, you can do a little on-site textual criticism where you look at it and go, well, I know what they meant here. I can see where the mistake happened. I know how to correct this. It doesn't actually change your ability to know what the text said. The other day when I was... Um, Walking down the hallway at night, uh, my kids have this time in, in bed at night before they're uh, asleep and they're reading. This was a couple years ago, but I was walking by my son John's room. He's now almost 14, but I'm walking by his room. It's maybe 10 o'clock at night, and he's in there reading, and he said, Dad, come in here. So I was like, all right. So I walked in, and he goes, I found a mistake in this book. Now, my son was reading a book that had sold so many millions of copies that I don't even want to try to put a number on it. We're talking about millions and millions and millions and millions of copies. Probably one of the best-selling books ever. And he said, Dad, I found a mistake. And in my mind, I'm saying, no, you didn't. In my mind, I'm thinking, oh, son, you think you found a mistake. But do you have any idea how many editors have been over that book? Do you have any idea how many professionals have looked at that book? Do you have any idea how many editions of that book have gone out? How many computers have scanned that book? What is the statistical chance that my 13-year-old son lying in bed one night found a mistake that no one else could find? And of course, I didn't say any of this out loud, just so you know. <laughs> You're thinking, I hate to be his son, right? Uh, no, I'm thinking this in my head. I'm like, well, John, show me what you found. And what he did is he showed me a legitimate mistake in this book. I could not believe it. I looked at it, I thought, there's no way this is there. And he showed me, he goes, and he goes, this is a mistake, and it really was. I thought I probably should have wrote a letter to the publisher I maybe gotten some reward or something, I don't know. But I, I, I put the book down, and as I left the room, I thought to myself, you know, that's not that different than the, than the way it works with our manuscripts. You find an error, you just keep reading. It doesn't actually affect the meaning of the text. Even a book as meticulous as that made a mistake, but it doesn't change the tenor of the story in the slightest. Here's the other thing I want to notice about quality of manuscripts, and that is, what do we know about early Christian scribes? This is, an earliest, this is an interesting question. Do we have any evidence that scribes in early Christianity knew what they were doing? Actually, we have a good bit of evidence on the score. Um, one of the things I don't even mention in your notes is uh, early Christian scribal handwriting, what's known as paleography. Um, actually, a number of our manuscripts from Christian scribes are very uh, elegant scripts, a very professional hand, and we know that uh, these would have been people who would have been trained scribes, and so we we can look at it that way, but let me mention two other things that actually highlight something about early scribal culture within, within Christianity, perhaps something you've never thought of. And one of those is the type of format that Christians use when they copied their books. Now, when you think about an ancient book, kind of a picture in your head, an ancient, very old book, chances are what you're picturing is a scroll. Because in the ancient world, that's what people did. And a scroll, as you know, is a is a piece of papyrus with writing on one side rolled up at the edges. That's what people use in the ancient world. And when Christianity was born in the first century, everybody used scrolls. Their Jewish forefathers copied the Old Testament on scrolls. The Greco-Roman culture around them, when they copied literary texts, they used scrolls. Everybody used scrolls. But guess what? When Christians started copying the New Testament, they didn't use scrolls. In fact, they used something called a codex. Now, a codex is the book format where you have writing on both sides of the page, right, unlike a scroll, and it's bound at the spine. 
And here's the amazing thing about the Codex is that you still use it now. If you have a Bible near you, it's in Codex format. When you open up a hymnal, it's in Codex format. When you open up any book in the world, it's in Codex format. Here's the thing about the Codex is the Codex, born during this time period, ends up being one of the most enduring technological advances in book production in the history of the world. And what Christians did from the very start is they used the Codex for their scriptural writings. And they didn't use the scroll. Now, this has stunned scholars for generations, okay? Scholars have looked at this and go, we have no idea why Christians did this. It's such a conundrum. They, it's sort of this CSI thing they're trying to forensically crack. How, how is it that Christians did this and no one else did it? And why would they do it? Here's the thing that's interesting about the Codex is that as far back as we can see early New Testament manuscripts, they're all on codices. We can't even hardly find a single one not on a Codex. Now, the reason for this, I think, is multidimensional, but one of the reasons for this, I think, that's interesting is that some scholars have suggested, and I think there's something to this, that Christians chose the Codex because it could do something that no role would ever do or could ever do, and that is it could hold all four Gospels in one volume. In other words, Christians may have wanted to use the Codex because they needed it to hold all their, their, four, their, their precious four stories of Jesus together as a unit. Regardless of the reason, though, the point I want you to see is that with an early Christian scribal culture, there was an amazing amount of uniformity around what book type to use. And it was the kind of uniformity that swam directly in the face of every other expectation you would have. So if someone said, hey, all Christians use the scroll, that must mean uniformity, you wouldn't give it any credit because everybody's using scrolls. But if all Christians use the codex, then that does tell you something about early Christian uniformity in their scribal culture because you had to have a reason to do it that swam against the culture. And the question is, how'd that happen? Did someone set out a memo somewhere? All scribes out there use the codex? How'd that take place? That tells you that there's a very organized Christian scribal culture that somehow, some way, even though we don't understand it, they were very connected in the way they copied books. It's interesting. Uh, I put in your notes there, 2 Timothy 4.13. I think this is a reference to the codex and Paul. Um, in fact, I don't think, I'm almost certain that it is based on all what we can see. Look, look what it says here. I bet you read over this verse 50 times and never even thought about it. When you, he's talking to Timothy here. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all the parchments. Do you know something about Paul here? He mentions two kinds of writings. Did you notice this? He tells Timothy, bring the books, ta biblia in the Greek, and then bring the parchments, um, membrana in the Greek. What's interesting about this is that the first one is clearly a reference to Old Testament books. So what in the world is the membrana? What's the parchments he wants Timothy to bring? Scholars have uniformly been convinced that that's a reference to, to codices. So what you find here in Paul is that he's telling Timothy to bring two different sets of books, an Old Testament set on scrolls and perhaps a New Testament or a beginnings of a New Testament on codices. What was in these codices, these parchments that Paul's asking for? That's a mystery, right? Wouldn't you want to know the answer to that? We don't know the answer to that, but we can hypothesize. But it's clear that it's not Old Testament books, as you already talked about those. Could it be Christian writings? Probably. Which ones? We don't know. But this is the beginning of a canon, right? You have an Old Testament and the beginnings of a New Testament here. And what is it on? It's on a codex. The other thing I'll mention here by, by way of scribal culture and early Christianity is the use of what's called the nomina sacra. It's just Latin for sacred names. Um, chances are you've probably never uh, heard of this either, but this is an interesting scribal abbreviation that Christian scribes used. It's the way they abbreviated the Greek words for God, Lord, Jesus, and Christ. What's amazing about this abbreviation is that it's only done by Christians. Um, and it's done on those four words, God, Lord, Jesus, and Christ, and it's a way of honoring the divine name. And what's stunning about it is it occurs in almost every single New Testament manuscript we have everywhere, as far back as we can go. Now, how do you, how do you get that in a scribal culture? The use of the Noma Sacra, that uniform across the board, along with the use of the Codex, that uniform across the board, what does that tell you? That tells you that you have a very sophisticated book culture in early Christianity that used a very highly developed book technology in the Codex, uniform in their practices, and pretty well organized. You combine that with very good handwriting in a number of early New Testament manuscripts and a number of other features we've already talked about, you have a scribal culture that can copy books. And not only can they copy books, they can copy them well and accurately. What does that mean? That means Ehrman's claim here 
that, hey, you know, Christian scribal culture was a bunch of amateurs who didn't know how to copy books. That's simply not borne out by the evidence. From what we can see by the manuscripts, that's not true. The manuscripts tell us that the guys that were copying these books knew what they were doing in terms of scribal production. Now, wrapping up this second talk then, we've tackled this issue of transmission uh, in Ehrman's case just very simply. Um, he's saying, look, it's so, so much corruptions entered into the text, you could never know what it says. Our answer is, well, no, we can't know what it says. We have enough copies, we have enough early copies, and we have enough copies in the scribal culture, and when we look at the actual changes that take place, we can see that most of those are meaningless variants that have no effect on the meaning of the text, and we can actually have a high level of confidence that the words we have are the words that were originally written. You have to realize that when God gave his word, he gave his word through normal historical channels. And I want you to get this today. People get hung up by textual variations and scribal changes. And, and my answer to them is, well, well what do you expect to happen if God's going to give his book through normal historical channels? Is, he gonna, like, is God going to retroactively send the Gutenberg printing press back to the first century miraculously so they could run off books then? Well, if he's going to do that, why not just lower the, t the, the Bible from heaven on golden tablets, right? Like the angel Moroni in the Book of Mormon. Just lower them from heaven and it's all done. You don't need earthly scribes. For whatever providential reasons, God gave his books in real time, real space, real history to be copied in the normal processes. And in the normal processes, you're going to have scribal variations. If you tried to copy something, you would have scribal variations. Here's the trick. That, none of that should surprise us. What you should be grateful for is that even though that's true, God has preserved our text historically so well that we can have a lot of confidence that what we're reading are the words that were written by the earliest authors. Okay, we're at the point where we're going to do some Q&A.